Hello, and welcome to Other Voices Online, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this month's edition of Other Voices, we're going to take a look at the newly formed coalition government in Israel, a key ally of the United States in a critical region. Many, if not most, commentators are calling the new government the most right-wing government in the history of Israel. What will this swing to the hard right mean for Israelis, including Palestinian citizens of Israel? What will it mean for the Palestinians living in the occupied territories? And what will it mean for the U.S.-Israeli relationship and the region in general? To help us answer these questions, I am really pleased to welcome back Professor Joel Bainan, Emeritus Professor of History and Middle East History at Stanford University. Joel, welcome back to Other Voices. Thanks very much, Paul. It's always lovely to be here. As, uh, I, I'll just um, point out to uh, our, our listeners and viewers here, I was trying to think how many times you've been a guest on Other Voices, and it dawned on me that in the 26 years that we've been producing this, first as a TV show and since the pandemic is a Zoom webinar. Um, after all those, I, I still don't know how many times you've been on, but I, I recalled that you were the very first guest that we had when we launched in November of 1996. And guess what you were talking about? <laughs> the Nothing occupation wants to go away. Yes. Well, let, let's get into this. Um, and let, let's start with some definitions. Why are all these commentators calling this the most right-wing government in the history of Israel? What is it about this government? Who's in it? Give us an idea of just why this is considered a right-wing government, and then we'll get into what it what it's going to do now that they're in power. Well, it certainly is the most right-wing government, but saying that doesn't quite capture its character. Um, it's a neo-fascist, religio-nationalist, populist government, and not enough people are using those words. Uh, what I mean by that is um, Itamar ben Gvir, who is a minister in the government uh, and who will have lots of authority over what goes on in the West Bank, uh, is a follower of uh, the late Rabbi Meir Kahana, who was an avowed uh, racist and Jewish supremacist and who advocated transferring uh, the Arab citizen population of Israel out of the country. Uh, he had for many years a picture of Baruch Goldstein in his home which he proudly showed to visitors. Baruch Goldstein was an American Jewish immigrant to Israel who lived in Kiryat Arba, a settlement outside Hebron, Al Khalil in Arabic. And in February of 1994, as a protest against the Oslo Accords, uh, he uh, shot down in cold blood 29 Muslims who were praying in the Ibrahimi Mosque, which in the Jewish tradition is the uh, the cave where the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried. Um, there is Ben Gvir uh, during the uh, intensification of uh, tension and, and violence in the run up to the May 2021 Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip, set up an office. Uh, he was then a member of parliament, not a minister of the government, set up uh, his office in the uh, neighborhood of uh, Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, which uh, has been for many years now, subject to uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, so he's a provocateur, straight up. Uh, Betzalel Smotrich, who is the head of the Religious Zionism Party uh, and is also a minister and um, will be responsible uh, in his capacity as a minister of internal security for the police. Uh, is another uh, religious, populist, ultra-nationalist right-winger. Uh, and then there is Avi Maoz, who is the head of the extreme homophobic Noam party. All these three parties were brought together to run on one list uh, for the parliamentary election by 
uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. That's that's worth explaining because the Israeli electoral system is very different than ours. It in sure Israel, is. <laughs> in Israel, you have a single constituency proportional representation system. What does that mean? The entire country is one constituency. Uh, parties submit a list. There are 120 seats in the Knesset. You cast your vote for a party. If a party gets 10% of the vote, it gets 10% of the Knesset seats, so 12%, 12 seats out of the 120. If it gets 20% of the vote, it gets 24 seats. You need to get enough votes to get at least four Knesset members in, so at least 3.25% of the vote. And that threshold was set that high uh, by many of the same forces backing uh, Netanyahu now in an effort to keep the Arab parties out of Knesset altogether. Uh, so in order not to lose any right-wing votes, uh, Netanyahu brought together these uh, Jewish supremacist, neo-fascist elements in one party and ended up uh, with 14% uh, of the votes, and they're the third largest party in the Knesset. And, and after all this, this coalition, uh, out of a total of, if my numbers are right, four and a half million votes cast, the Netanyahu bloc that is now going to be setting policy for Israel got uh, less than 30,000 votes more than the opposition. Is that right? It's a 30,000 vote margin out of 4.2 million? I think closer to 35,000, but that doesn't quite capture what happened. Because as I said, if you don't get 3.25% of the votes, your votes don't count. So one Arab party uh -huh. came very close to getting 3.25% of the votes, but didn't quite make it. So their votes were totally wiped out. Um, Balad is uh, a secular Arab nationalist party whose program has been since its inception that Israel should be a state for all its citizens, as opposed to a Jewish state. Uh, the other party which didn't make it in was the left Zionist Merits Party. They came even closer. Uh, but since they didn't get 3.25% of the votes, their votes don't count. Um, so if you would have added the, those votes together, uh, if they had gotten in, then, then Netanyahu's bloc wouldn't have even gotten the majority at all. But, but that also doesn't tell the whole story, because a good number of the parties and voters on the other side of the line, that is the anti-Netanyahu a block actually don't disagree with the Likud and its right wing allies on anything other than that they hate Netanyahu. So <laughs> several of the parties in the anti Netanyahu block are actually as right wing as Netanyahu's Likud, or perhaps even more so when it comes to the future of the occupied Palestinian territories, for example. Doesn't sound like good news at all. And I understand now why people are labeling the, this government this way. Let's start off, um, as I said in the introduction, I want to see what the impact is on um, people who live in Israel and uh, the voters of Israel, which includes 20% of the population are Palestinian uh, Israelis. Um, so Let's start there. What does this mean for the Israelis? And I, I want to get into this by sharing with the, the audience just a few lines from a recent article from New Yorker magazine explaining some of the reaction already uh, from within Israel. Uh, quoting from this article, more than a thousand former senior Israeli Air Force officers, including the former Israeli Defense Force chief, delivered a letter to the country's top jurist stating that the government would quote unquote, destroy the democratic country for which they had fought. 400 leading entrepreneurs, managers, and investors sent Netanyahu a letter warning of quote, the devastating consequences for the economy in general and the high tech industry in particular that may result from the legislative processes taking place in the Knesset, end quote. And recently, the former prime minister, Ehud Barak, 
said that, quote, this government is carrying out a coup in Israel before our eyes with its racism, corruption, neutering of the justice system, politicization of the police, and undermining of the chain of command in the Israeli Defense Forces, end quote. That's a lot of concern expressed by broad swaths and major sectors of uh, Israeli society and, and the economy and the security structure. Um, are, are they overreacting? What's gonna be the, the effect, the, the impact on Israeli citizens, and again, 20% of those citizens are Palestinian or of Arab origin. So they, on the one hand, aren't overreacting, and on the other hand, are totally obscuring the character of the problem. When President Trump was elected in this country, you had uh, a certain current within the Democratic Party the resistance current, for example, that said, oh my God, total destruction of American democracy, totally different than everything that is going on in this country before. Well, that wasn't true. Trump didn't drop from the sky. There's a long history of white supremacist populism uh, that produced Trump going at least as far back as Nixon's Southern strategy, you could even maybe say go as far back as the Dixiecrats in, in 1948 and Strom Thurmond. So this, similarly, this government of Israel didn't drop from the sky. For decades, people have been saying, if we continue to occupy the Palestinians, if we continue to exercise a regime of oppression and domination over Palestinians in the West Bank, if we continue to treat Palestinian citizens of Israel as second-class citizens, our society is going to be corrupted. I lived in Israel in the early 1970s and very uh, bright and devoted practicing Orthodox Jew, Yishayahu Leibovitch, brilliant scholarly credentials. He's the editor of the Encyclopedia Judaica in Hebrew and also a, a scientist at the Hebrew University. He said, if this occupation continues, we're going to become Judeo-Nazis. Well, I wouldn't use a phrase like that myself. I just would back off a little bit, but <laughs> it was right on the mark. I mean, he predicted what would happen, and, and that's what's happened. And uh, frankly, that's why I left the country in the early 1970s, because I saw it coming, although I didn't imagine in my worst nightmare that it would be as bad as it is now. So yes, on the one hand, this is the worst Israeli government. But on the other hand, it's not a radical break from what preceded it. It, it flows quite organically from what has been going on. Uh, at least since 2009, but arguably uh, since much earlier than that. Yeah, I, I recall from previous conversations that this is has been a recurring theme that the Israeli electorate has been moving further and further to the right itself. It, it's not like this was an unexpected trend or, or result. And I, I appreciate you putting that into some context. Um, it seems like one of the things that Israelis um, are most concerned about is some of the changes, proposed changes to the judicial system in particular. Can you talk about that and, and what, what they're after here? Right. So in the 19, Israel doesn't have a constitution, we begin from that uh, problem. It has instead a series of basic laws. Uh, in the 1990s, the Israeli Supreme Court uh, had a significant number of liberals in Israeli terms, and they interpreted those basic laws, which mentioned things like the equality of all citizens, uh, in a very expansive way. It was something like 
the Warren Supreme Court, if you want an American parallel. Uh, and that resulted in things like women have the right to be combat soldiers. I mean, we might not think that was such a wonderful achievement, that particular <laughs> thing, but that was a very <coughs> radical break in Israeli uh, culture. Uh, LGBTQ rights, uh, rights for LGBTQ people to adopt children, uh, a whole range of things which did not touch the structure of the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and only minimally improved the standing of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, now, what this meant in terms of, I mean, Israel is, a, is not a democratic society in terms that Americans would normally understand that word. So for example, uh, it's been the case in Israel since it was established that um, there's no public transportation on the Sabbath except in Haifa, because Haifa was always a mixed Arab Jewish city. So Arab buses ran on the Sabbath, Jewish buses didn't. Um, but then uh, upper middle class suburbs of Tel Aviv, where a large proportion of the population is secular, uh, wanted to be able to get to Tel Aviv and drink coffee on Saturday in their favorite cafe or go to a movie or go to the shopping mall. So local jurisdictions start past rules that say, yeah, you, you, you can, malls can be open, uh, cafes can be open, that, that was previously illegal, movie theaters can have Saturday matinees, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and the Supreme Court basically said, yeah, that's a local jurisdiction problem. You can do that. So all these uber religious nationalists, I mean, think, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, they're, they're those kind, that kind of interpretation of Jewish law. So no, 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 that's not okay. And, and so they didn't like the idea that the, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of individual civil rights, right to choose on all sorts of that. And they want a hardline public uh, regime uh, that will lean heavily in the direction of their interpretation of Orthodox Judaism, that will uh, crack down on uh, liberal excesses of all sorts, certainly LGBTQ rights, but even, for example, um, Israel has uh, a law of return. Any Jew can come to Israel and become a citizen of Israel. Who is a Jew, according to that uh, definition? It's the Nazi definition of who a Jew is. If you have one Jewish grandparent, you're Jewish. Well, that is contrary to Orthodox Halakha, religious law, Sharia, if you will. Halakha and Sharia actually even mean the same thing and they function in a comparable way. They mean those words mean the same thing? I, I didn't know path. that before. They mean the path. Huh. Uh, and so according to Halakha, you have to have a Jewish mother. Jewishness is heritable through the maternal law. So okay, they so their proposal now, they haven't done this yet, but they have in the coalition agreement to enact this, only Jews who have a Jewish parent are gonna be eligible for the right of return. Now, um, they aren't throwing out the somewhere between quarter of a million and 300 and something thousand Jews from the former Soviet Union who are not Jewish in any way, shape, or form. Um, they're gonna let them be, and by now their children have served in the Israeli army and you know, they're cool, they're, they're, that, that's okay. Uh, but this would mean that a lot of Ukrainian Jews, for example, uh, who might have been thinking about coming to Israel won't be able to come. So, I mean, of course, this is a small potatoes thing compared to the massive structural oppression of the Palestinian people uh, in the state of Israel since day one. But this outrages American Jews 
Why? Because Reform Judaism is the largest organized denomination of American Jews. And Reform Judaism has for some years now accepted that, okay, well, if your father is Jewish and your mother's not, we're going to accept you as Jewish. Well, okay, but not according to orthodoxy. So now we've got an argument between the Reform denomination in the United States and the entire Israeli religious hierarchy. Now, why is the Israeli religious hierarchy important? Because they control all matters of uh, personal family relations. So marriage, divorce, burial, inheritance, child custody, uh, all of that is adjudicated according to religious law. If you're Jewish, according to halakha, if you're Muslim, according to Sharia, if you're Christian, according to whatever denomination you belong to. So uh, here you got- Like, like for example- they, 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 like, Jews aren't real Jews. Let me just ask a question to put this in, in context for myself. Uh, I understand that there's no such thing as civil marriage in, in Israel. Is that correct? Only, there's only religious marriage according to the community to which you belong. Now, if you go abroad, if you, if, if you if a Jew and a Muslim want to be married in Israel, I mean, this does happen from time to time, or a Jew and a Christian or a Christian and a Muslim, they go to Cyprus and get a civil marriage and come back and the state recognizes their marriage, no problem. But if a reform Jew, if, if, a, if an American Jew who is converted to Judaism by a reform rabbi in the United States goes to Israel to live and marries an Israeli Jew about whose Jewishness there is no question because their mother is Jewish, Rabbis don't accept that as a Jewish marriage because the Reformed Jew who's converted to Judaism by a Reformed rabbi isn't Jewish according to Orthodox law. So this has been a major irritant for some time, but now the new government is going to up the ante considerably. Now, you know, people like us might not care too much about this stuff, but it's an expression of uh, a religio-authoritarian mindset that is going to uh, have a great deal to do with how things go moving forward. Let's let's move on to the next major area of impact, and that's obviously on the Palestinians who um, reside within the uh, occupied territories, becoming ever more occupied. Uh, what does this new government mean for them, and especially coming on the heels of one of the more violent uh, years in in quite a number of years, uh, a lot of uh, Palestinians were killed this past these past twelve months. Uh, you've already briefly mentioned the the new uh, minister of uh, security is his title, national security, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir. Um, what? What what are some of the highlight or low light impact <laughs> low light impacts um, of of this new government um, on the territory of Palestine and and the Palestinians? So Netanyahu, um, until he went to trial for on three different charges of corruption and sort of lost his political compass over that was very clever in maneuvering in the international arena in the sense that for him, the land between the Jordan River and the sea is the land of Israel. Jews are the only people who have any national rights whatsoever in that land. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, uh, very large portions of the West Bank have been de facto annexed to Israel for some time. Uh, certainly the Jordan Valley, the settlements, the area between the separation barrier and the old green line, which used to demarcate the boundary between uh, Israel proper and the West Bank before 1967, they've all been de facto annexed. But Netanyahu understands that saying that they are de jure annexed will cause a huge international storm, not least with the authoritarian Muslim Arab countries, Qatar, 
the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, which have recently normalized relations with Israel, and Saudi Arabia, who he hopes will normalize relations with Israel, and whose relations with, with Israel are all but normalized. So Netanyahu has always said, well, we don't have to, we don't have to make any pronouncements. We're doing it. We, we, we have effectively annexed a huge chunk of the West Bank, and uh, we don't need to talk about that. So will, it, set, will settlement expansion be expected to uh, increase substantially? Yes. So the partners in the coalition, the religious Zionist party, that's not good enough for them. No, they want to declare annexation. They want the government to be committed to more settlements, expanding settlements, and annexation. So who's going to win that battle will depend on uh, how close Netanyahu's court cases are to throwing him in the slammer for corruption. Because if he thinks he's going to get off, then maybe he doesn't need them, and, and maybe he'll pull some party from the right wing that that ran against him. If he needs their votes to stay out of jail, then uh, they'll get more of their way, not only on the annexation question, but on all other questions as well. Uh, so, and, and while we're mentioning uh, Netanyahu's trial, that trial is going on right now, is it not? It is. Yes, it is. It They're is. hearing from witnesses and gathering evidence. Yeah. And in addition, You've got another minister in the government, uh, Arya Derry, who's twice convicted, and that has passed a special law that he could be a minister in the government because he's twice over convict. And and before this, he wouldn't have been able to serve. No. no. Will that same law help Netanyahu stay in? <laughs> well, Netanyahu, the, so the the, pe the parties that supported Netanyahu basically pledged that they would support uh, a law that would allow a prime minister who was convicted to serve. Uh, I mean, they're not going to pull the button on that law unless he looks like he is going to be convicted, and I don't know how that's going to turn out. I um, mean, it's going to grind on for quite a long time before that comes around. But part of what's going on here is Netanyahu put together a, a, a coalition block that he knows he can count on to give him a get out of jail free card. Ah, oh man, I thought our politics were messed up. Let's, um, I'm really getting concerned about time here. We've got a lot to talk about and we need to get our uh, audience members in here with their questions. So the third part of this is, uh, what does this new government mean for um, the ongoing relationship with the, the United States and even more broadly, the, the, the region there? But let's, well, let's talk about the relationship with the United States. We are still major funders for Israel and uh, rely on them to be a military partner in the region. And, and I understand and Biden. Joe Biden and Netanyahu are probably, Netanyahu is probably the foreign leader that Biden has known the longest, going back to when Biden was a young senator and Netanyahu was a diplomat in Washington. That's exactly where I was going to begin. <laughs> congratulated his good friend, Bibi, on winning the election. And uh, if you followed Secretary of State Blinken's uh, pronouncements, not least his outrageous speech to the J Street Conference in Washington that happened several weeks ago, Blinken basically said, well, basically, actually said, American aid to Israel is sacrosanct. It's holy. We don't conduct a policy discussion on whether or not the United States should give Israel $3.8 billion a year. That's a sacrament. Uh, so there won't be any discussion about that. Uh, maybe Itamar ben Gvir won't be welcome in Washington, and maybe Betzalel Smotrich won't be welcome in Washington, and maybe Abi Maoz won't be welcome in Washington. I mean, they're the, they are the 
fascist bloc in the government, the three of them. Uh, but <laughs> that won't make any difference, actually. Uh, uh, that won't make any difference at all. And Secretary of State Blinken is on his way over there right now to chat those people up um, and, and to try to convince them that they oughtn't, for example, what's on the agenda for this week, Komesh, a settlement that is illegal by Israeli standards, but which the right-wing religious folk have been clinging on to for dear life and which the government coalition guidelines say that the government is going to legalize it. And Blinken said, oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that because then there won't be two states. No, I'm sorry. That train left the station a long time ago. <laughs> yes. Uh, if, if, that, if those are the terms that the United States is going to try to influence Israeli policy, I mean, then we're in uh, Cloud Cooper land. Yeah, that's that's not really uh, wielding any kind of influence or or leverage whatsoever. When you say aid is sacrosanct, you take away whatever leverage you you might have had to uh, try to enforce uh, human rights, for example. So, There's also a whole other argument that conditioning aid on observance of certain human rights standards doesn't work anyway. Uh, Sarah Lee Whitson, who was for many years the director of the Middle East and North Africa uh, program at Human Rights Watch, and who is now the executive director of democracy for the Arab world now, has been arguing very vociferously, and in my opinion, quite convincingly, that conditioning aid doesn't do any good. What you need to do, if you're serious, and the United States, of course, is not serious about human rights uh, anywhere in the world. If you're serious, what you do is you cut aid. And there were a number of things that uh, the former guy, as he's being <laughs> known, uh, did with uh, is with regard to Israel, most specifically uh, moving the embassy. And I, I believe Joe Biden during the campaign promised to move the embassy back. Uh, is there any movement on reversing anything that Donald Trump did? No. Uh, the embassy is still in Jerusalem. There is a, so it seems to be a delay about its construction, uh, in part because it sits on land which is claimed by the Khalidi family uh, meaning the family of Rashid Khalidi, who was a Palestinian American, an American citizen, and a prominent professor at Columbia University with a platform to talk about this stuff. So, you know, it's a little bit problematic if you construct an American embassy on the private property of an American citizen who claims you don't have the right to do that. <laughs> so we have a little bit issues about that. But on all the other things, um, reopening the PLO office in Washington. No, that hasn't happened. Uh, the United States has restored some of the financial aid uh, to uh, not the Palestinian Authority directly, but to Palestinian uh, institutions that was cut by uh, the former president. Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, but for the most part, no, What what whatever was done uh, in the Trump era stands, including recognition of Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights, of East Jerusalem, and so on. Not good news again. <laughs> uh, okay, let's open this up to our uh, audience members. And what we'd like you to do is um, click on the raise hand icon, which is at the, the bottom of your screen. And when you raise your hand, we, you will get a, a little message uh, asking you to unmute. And when you click on that, you'll be able to ask your question. We're not gonna bring you on camera unless this unmute thing doesn't work. And apparently it doesn't work with all versions of, of Zoom. So, um, and you can also type in questions under in the Q&A and we can try to, uh, read these, these questions off here. So uh, again, raise hand and wait for the prompt to unmute. Uh, if it won't work on your system, we'll deal with that then. And otherwise um, we will 
read from the Q&A column. And I see the first question in the text Q&A uh, comes from Mitchell Zimmerman, which has his, who has his hand up. So Mitchell, please uh, join us. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm not, forget about the question I had there. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Joey can talk a bit about the impact of the new government on um, the rights of uh, Palest uh, Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. You kind of alluded to that, but didn't say much about it. Right, thanks, Mitchell. Um, so uh, somewhere between 20 and 21% of all Israeli citizens are Palestinian Arabs. Uh, they have nominal full citizenship rights, meaning they can vote and they can vote for a, an array of political parties. There are four primarily Arab parties uh, that have seats in the Israeli Knesset. Um, and um, there's an Arab uh, justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, the High Court of Justice, it's called in Israel. There are uh, Palestinian Israeli uh, diplomats. I think uh, the Consul General in Atlanta is Palestinian Israeli, or if not the current one, the recent past one. Uh, Palestinian Israelis are uh, highly represented in the medical system. 17% of all doctors, 45% of all nurses, 50% of all pharmacists are Palestinian citizens of Israel. The Israeli medical system simply couldn't function without them. Um, that said, all of that said, the 2018 basic law, Israel nation state of the Jewish people, makes it clear that they are second class citizens. Why? Because that law, first of all, it um, took away Arabic as an official language of the state of Israel. Up until that point, both mm -hmm. and Arabic were official languages. Now, Arabic is a special language, whatever that means. Uh, secondly, the law says that uh, Israel is the expression and the sole legitimate expression of the right to self-determination of the entire Jewish people, the worldwide Jewish people. Uh, so Mitchell, that state of Israel, that represents your right to self-determination whether or not you were interested. So happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what that means is the indigenous population of the country have no national claims, no legally legitimate national claims. So if a Palestinian citizen of Israel comes and says, I was born here. My great, 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 great grandparents were born here before you who just came from Brooklyn uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so uh, this country should express my national identity too, at a minimum, too. Uh, no, then no, that is not a legal claim that can be made. The law also says that Jewish settlement is a national priority, meaning state of Israel had constructed since it was established in 1948, something, I think the number is 600 new Jewish settlements, but not a single new Palestinian Arab settlement. So consequently, res residency is super segregated. Most Palestinians live in all Arab villages. Uh, they have not been given more land to expand for the most part. So therefore most, uh, and, and they don't have uh, public planning uh, 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 documents that would govern where new buildings can be constructed. So most new construction is illegal and therefore from time to time the Israeli police come around and knock down buildings and, and so on. So, uh, and kind of at the baseline, 40% of all of the private lands of Palestinian Arabs who became citizens of Israel after 1948 were confiscated. So in huge structural ways, 
there is institutional discrimination that began from day one, first on day two, the entire Palestinian Arab citizen population of Israel was put under martial law. And from 1949 to 1966, uh, martial law prevailed over all but a tiny minority of them. Uh, so there was never equality. And that's not even a question of, of substantive equality. Simply it has never existed. No one would even argue that it ought to exist on the, on the Zionist side. Um, and this government is going to uh, push that to the max. Thank you for the question, Mitchell. Um, let me take one out of the uh, queue here, uh, read a question, and then we'll go to uh, Eduardo Cohen, who has his hand up next. The question in uh, submitted here is, can you explain why younger Israelis, unlike Americans, are more right-wing and racist than their parents' generation? Yes, this has a very simple explanation. The overwhelming majority of Jewish Israelis exclude the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim, because they don't serve in the army, but the overwhelming majority of Jewish Israelis serve in the army. You go to the army and your task is to exercise domination over the Palestinians living in the West Bank and periodically invade or bomb the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Um, and that breeds racism. Uh, it not only breeds racism, uh, it breeds a kind of violent militarism. Uh, and there is the only anecdote, antidote to that is total refusal. And there is uh, a, a small number of Israeli Jews who have been refusing to serve in the army. And the number has increased Significantly, it doesn't get to be a very large number at all. But since the uh, the November election, which brought this government to power, um, the, the number of refusers has, has gone up. But it, it's the army, pure, pure, very, very simple and and, and short uh, explanation for, for this phenomenon. Thank you for that question, Este. All right, let's go to uh, Eduardo Cohen. Hello, Eduardo. Uh, unmute. There we go. Hi, guys. Hi, I, I, I'm wondering if either the leadership of Hamas or the Palestinian Authority have responded in any way to this change in Israeli politics and also how it might affect uh, the case that Palestinians are trying to bring against Israel in the international court. So the, it, the Palestinian Authority has brought a case against Israel in the international court. The court is, um, how shall we say, moving slower than molasses on it because it's a political time bomb. I mean, that's obvious. It was obvious from day one. Um, Palestinian Authority is in between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they have been effectively the collaborators with the Israeli government. Uh, in a security partnership, which in the West Bank means suppressing Hamas and even more recently uh, other non-Hamas unorganized uh, expressions of armed resistance by young people who have simply had it. They have fed up and they can't take it anymore. And they began to organize themselves independently and uh, Israel cracked down very, very hard on them, especially in the northern West Bank cities of Nablus and, and Janine. And that's one of the reasons for the escalation in the number of Palestinians killed during calendar 2022 as compared to earlier years. So the Palestinian authorities, I mean, they're, they're, they are without resources. There is nothing they can do uh, to oppose what is about to happen because they would have to repudiate their role as security partner for Israel and, and basically give up their whole thing. Now, they may not survive very long under this new regime, the Palestinian Authority, for two reasons. First, because uh, as the Israeli government becomes more and more aggressive and distasteful, the Palestinian Authority will face more and more criticism from its own people. But also, perhaps equally important, 
uh, Mahmoud Abbas is 84 years old and not in good health, and he's going to be gone soon, and he's going to be a very uh, potentially messy struggle for succession after he's gone, and there could be lots of instability in the Palestinian Authority. Um, Hamas has said, don't mess around with the status quo on the Haram al-Sharif, uh, the noble sanctuary, or the Temple Mount, Harabayat, as it's known in the Jewish tradition. So, of course, one of the first things that Itamar ben Gvir did after the government was inaugurated was to march himself up there for a visit and pray, which, in principle, Jews aren't supposed to be doing up there. The status quo is Jews can visit, Muslims can pray. Um, and, and this upsets Jordan also because Jordan is nominally the custodian uh, of the, the Haram al-Shami. And it upsets Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia sees itself as the leader of the Sunni Muslim world. So uh, big open question, is Itamar Ben Gvir's um, religious zealotry and, and penchant for uh, provocative behavior going to lead him to provoke Hamas to shoot rockets at Jerusalem, which they did uh, in, in May of 2021, which was one of the steps in the escalation that resulted in the Israeli assault uh, on, on, on the uh, Gaza Strip after Israel had been provoking people, uh, preventing them from praying during Ramadan and so on for nearly a month. Uh, is that going to happen? Could very well happen. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it's not in Hamas's interest to provoke a clash. Uh, it's better for them if they are seen as responding to a provocation. There almost certainly will be a provocation. How serious, how serious Hamas will decide to take it, that's unknown. I'd like to follow up on uh, Eduardo's question about the uh, International Court of Justice. Um, regardless of how slowly they're moving, uh, am I remembering right that Netanyahu has withheld the tax, the Palestinian tax money that Israel collects on behalf of Palestine, but they're not giving um, the PLO the uh, or the Palestinian Authority their own revenues. Right. Uh, that's actually the probably the most substantive thing regarding the Palestinians under occupation that has happened. So the arrangement is that Israel collects taxes, uh, import, export duties, and such like that, and transfers them to the Palestinian Authority. They already were withholding a certain proportion because the Palestinian Authority pays a monthly stipend to the families of martyrs. So the martyrs, from the Israeli point of view, are terrorists. So you pay the terrorist families, we deduct that money from your taxes that you get. That's been going on for a long time. So now they announce that they're going to punish the Palestinian Authority further because it is promoting uh, and, and pushing this case in the International Court of Justice, uh, pressing the court to decide on the legality of the Israeli occupation. So uh, that, that, that could blow up in Israel's face, or could blow up in everybody's face, because a huge proportion of the employed population in the West Bank is employed directly by the Palestinian Authority in one form or another. And if they don't get their tax money, then they're not going to be able to pay their salaries, and then there'll be a problem. Okay, let's go to the, our next uh, raised hand here, Roberta Alquist. And see it in process. And as soon as you unmute, there we go. Roberta, what's your question? Hi, uh, Walt has a question. Uh, we're sitting here and Walt Bliss is going to ask it. Okay. Yeah, hi, uh, we're partners here. So, and I'm computer illiterate. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to ask your guest if he's aware of uh, David Hurst's book, The Gun and the Olive Branch. Sitting right on my shelf in back of me there. <laughs> yeah, the one that says that uh, Theodor Herzl, Herzl was duplicitous in that 
publicly, he said, as a Zionist, he said one thing that we, uh, the Jews will blend very nicely and friendly with the existing indigenous population. And in his diary, which is only revealed 30 years after he died, that uh, we, we will never really agree to that. We're going to move all of the Jews, excuse me, all of the Palestinians by transference into the transfer countries uh, or uh, or some other solution, meaning death, really. So that's the Palestinians, uh, that, excuse me, that's the Zionist program. Uh, how many Jews today would you say are aware of that? So actually, you, you, you didn't relate that entirely accurately. And, you know, Herzl was a European liberal in a colonial era. Exactly right. You know, by definition, the lives of non-European peoples are of less consequence. And in his diary, he wrote all manner of things. We'll spirit the penniless population across the border. Uh, we'll pay uh, lots of money for land that they're willing to sell us because we're Jews are rich and we control world finances. I mean, in many ways, Herzl had was partner with anti-Semitic notions of who the Jewish people are. Um, and uh, But we're not going to sell them anything back. And then on the other hand, he writes this utopian novel, uh, Alt Neuland, Old New Land, in which uh, you've got a German-speaking Zionist state there where every, the standard of living has been raised and everybody's been happy. So the early Zionists, not only Herzl, were moving between um, different fantasies. And among the early Zionists, the one who called it publicly and cleanly was Vladimir Jabotinsky, who is the ideological founder of the current of Zionism, which uh, ultimately resulted in the Likud, the party that Benjamin Netanyahu leads. And in 1920, he wrote an article called The Iron Wall. And he said, all you labor Zionists and other uh, do-gooder types, you think that because you're going to raise the Arab standard of living that they're going to acquiesce? No. No, no people agrees that foreigners can come and take their country away from them and establish their own state and, and not allow the indigenous people any political expression. That's just not going to happen. And Arabs are no different than anybody else in, in this respect. They're not going to resist us because they're anti-Semites or anything like that. They're going to resist us because colonized people resist their colonizers. And that is just the way it is. And uh, so get armed, create an army, get ready to fight. And we will fight them until we have utterly and totally defeated them. And then we'll make peace with them. So that that is the operative uh, dictum of the people who are running the state of Israel today, and in fact, who have been running it for quite some time. Um, I mean, um, well, the contradictions in what Herzl said, you know, they're real enough, but, but, but they're uh, background noise, really. I don't think so. I, I disagree with you. I think it might be a source of Jewish guilt that, uh, that most, most Jews uh, realize that they've taken this land rather unfairly. And, uh, you know, you got a, a, a million people there, uh, uh, roughly around the turn of the century, and uh, even more so in 1946 or 47 or 48. And uh, really, this is so unfair. It is just so unfair to the Palestinians. You plan, or let me say, the Zionist plan is to run them all out of there. They, they're making life so in, in, uh, unlivable. They just hope they all leave. But when they don't leave, they kill them. So they kill them every day. It wasn't exactly a plan. Most Israeli Jews never heard of that story. They don't read Herzl's diaries, and they certainly don't notice any contradiction between what he said in his diaries and what he said more publicly. Um, I think a growing number of young American Jews are becoming increasingly disaffected because they, they see the injustice of the case. 
but not in Israel. The overwhelming majority, 70 something percent of Israeli Jews today define themselves as right wing. Uh, so there, there is, of course, an opposition. There, there's always an opposition, and it's even a heroic opposition. Um, and, and, and a certain sector of the Jewish opposition in Israel is uh, very open to working with Palestinians. Another sector, because it's Zionist, is not. Um, it, we're, we're very far from any substantial element of Israeli Jews. Uh, feeling that they have done something that's not right. Okay, I'm going to ask a quick one from the Q and A box, and then we will go to Margaret Rosenblum, who has her hand up. From the Q and A box, Linda Lopez Otero is asking about these recent reports that the new uh, security national security minister is going to ban the Palestinian flag again. What do we know about that, Joel? So uh, the Palestinian flag, hi, Linda. Uh, the Palestinian flag is not now illegal. The current status is that uh, it can be situationally banned if uh, the police or other security authorities on the spot determine that it is being displayed in order to incite terrorism or uh, other criminal activity. Well, of course, that is wide open for interpretation. And uh, Betzalel Smotrich said, we're going to be cracking down on the Palestinian flag. Uh, so they don't need an actual change in the law to do that. Um, in all probability, they will do that. Um, I mean, that's, of course, going to produce clashes because young people in particular are going to be waving the flag because it's their flag and because they want to assert their identity and their rights. Um, and uh, some of them are going to probably get shot doing it. So this is not going to be a good thing. Not good news again. Okay, Margaret Rosenblum has her hand up. David, who is behind the scenes directing tonight, if you can bring her on. Margaret, welcome. What's your question? I'm handing it over to Oscar. He's the one with the question. Okay. Yes, Joel. I wonder, uh, in your opinion, uh, who's running the government? Does Netanyahu really control his right-wing extreme, extreme uh, Ben Gvir and Shmolik and others? Can they exact more concessions from him? Or at the end of the day, uh, will they uh, take actions beyond what uh, Netanyahu may have anticipated or can control? All of that. <laughs> so in the past, when Netanyahu has been prime minister of hard right governments, I mean, if you go back the last several governments, each one has been the furthest right government that Israel has ever had, except for the one that immediately preceded the current one, which was a very strange creation. Um, and, and Netanyahu was always the adult in the room. No, we don't proclaim de jure annexation because the international community will not accept that. Yeah, go build more settlements, fine. Uh, please don't just wantonly kill Palestinians. That We don't need to do that. Uh, yeah, the army will protect you if you do, but really don't put us in that situation. It's not good. Um, but now Netanyahu has a serious problem. He needs a get out of jail free card if he's convicted on the one of the, one or, uh, of, or of the three uh, corruption charges on which he's currently uh, being tried. So the right wingers, first, they're bigger and more powerful just in terms of their numbers. There's 14 of them in, in, in the Knesset. Um, they can exact a higher price and have already, in fact, exacted a higher price. It's a little bit parallel to what happened to Kevin McCarthy and, and the crazy right wingers of the Republican Party just recently in his election uh, to the Speakership of the House. Uh, so the right wing can extract more and has already extracted more in the way of promises to do things differently from Netanyahu. Uh, they will go beyond what they have agreed to 
on paper because that's who they are. They're provocateurs. That's how they've made their political reputation. That's how they've built their following, especially Ben Gvir. Um, and, and Avi Ma'oz of Noam, the ultra homophobes as well, although they are a smaller factor. Uh, and Netanyahu may not be able to rein them in because he needs to get out of the jail free card. So this is all in motion and the particular way in which it unrolls is not predictable now. I mean, this is a government that yeah, hasn't even been in office for a month yet. So uh, it, it, it'll take a while to see how, how it's gonna go. So uh, stay tuned. And if uh, Paul asks me to come back, I will. <laughs> I will certainly ask you to come back. We are at the end of our time. Um, for those of you who still have questions pending in the Q&A box, I will, uh, I've taken a copy of those and I'll send them along to Joel and um, we'll see if we can get him to answer some of those. In the meantime, any uh, closing thoughts, Joel? Uh, well, stay tuned. As, as I said, this is, uh, this is a train wreck uh, waiting to happen. It's in motion, but it hasn't crashed yet. And we don't know what the ramifications of the crash will be uh, when it happens. I mean, uh, how substantially will Israeli actions shake up the nearly unanimous support for Israel in Congress? I mean, even Bernie Sanders, who is the best we've got, still talks about the democratic Jewish state of Israel. The only one who's challenging that language is Rashida Tlaib, bless her heart. I just sent her money uh, this morning because of that. Um, I mean, you know, con Congress is talking about this um, in, in, as if it were happening in some fairy tale reality. Uh, will the Israeli government do something that's so bad that a number of Congress people will wake up? Well, on the one hand, I hope it, it, they don't because it'll be really bad for that. But on the other hand, we do need that to happen. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, for those of you uh, watching, we do send out a follow-up uh, email with some additional resources for you. And Joel has shared a number of links of recent articles that he's written. So we'll be sending those uh, along to you along with any other, uh, with any answers to the questions that, that he may have. I wanna take a moment to thank David Simon very much, who's been uh, pushing all the buttons behind the scenes for us tonight. Joel Bainan, Professor of Middle East History at Stanford University, Emeritus. Um, thank you once again for joining us and uh, take care. And I'll probably have you back sooner than later, it sounds like. Thank you, Paul, and hi to everybody. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll be back next month. Don't know what we'll talk about, but it'll be something to talk about. Take care now. <laughs>